The Ukraine story, according to the American media, demonizing Vladimir Putin won't get it done. State-controlled reporting in Russia takes a hit. More and more journalists there are quitting their jobs. Plus, politics and tourism intersect online, the influencers on tour in Syria. Hello, I'm Richard Gisbert, and you're at The Listening Post, where we dig into the coverage and examine how news is being reported. For the past month, this program, like much of the world's media, has been focused squarely on Ukraine. Last week, we looked at the black hole where Russia's news and information space used to be, and the criminalization of dissent there. This week, we're turning to the media debate on Ukraine in the U.S., which is showing some disturbing signs of groupthink. At times, American news outlets can be like mirrors. They tend to reflect Washington's foreign policy consensus. Former Cold War warriors, ex-military and intelligence officials populate the airwaves. There is a significant shortage, though, on the historical context. On NATO, its gradual expansion across Eastern Europe that can be dangerous. Such topics might sound slightly off the mark when Russian bombs are hitting maternity hospitals in Ukraine. But history is loaded with examples of the perils that come with uncritical reporting and a rush of militarism. Our starting point this week is Ukraine, the American angle. A major question around what we are show. Starting with a proviso that we hear again and again, one that American journalists or analysts seem compelled to make when discussing Ukraine. Well, before I say anything else, I just want to say that uh, this invasion of Ukraine is a criminal action by Vladimir Putin. Uh, and um, that is the context in which everything is happening. And I don't want to say anything that could be mistaken for not understanding that. Um, now that said, of course... Failing to say that, or something along those lines on the American airwaves, let alone on social media, puts one at risk of being branded a Putin sympathizer. It should be possible to discuss the larger geopolitical context, including many mistakes made by Western policymakers, while at the same time laying the blame for, for the immediate conflict on Vladimir Putin, and where it belongs. It should also be possible for the coverage to include the basic context, the NATO question, and Moscow's point of view on the planned expansion of the Western military alliance right to Russia's southwestern border. It should be, but seldom is. What you're going to see instead is them basically legitimizing the presence of NATO and using Russia's invasion to further legitimize that NATO needs to be on Russia's doorstep and it needs to be in Ukraine in the future. What they should really be talking about is how did we get to this place? Representatives of 12 nations of Western Europe and North America assemble for the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty. NATO was constructed to basically provide a counterweight to the Soviet Union. Why does NATO still exist 30 years after the collapse of the Soviet Union? We should be asking that question. President Trump once again raised doubts about his commitment to NATO. You'll remember that when Trump was president, he would make the case that NATO was outdated, that NATO was irrelevant. What Vladimir Putin has done extremely well is make the case for NATO, right? Like Vladimir Putin has really been an advertisement for NATO. In my mind, we're in a very interesting time with the NATO discourse. Then there's the binary issue and the baggage many American journalists still carry from the so-called war on terror. This is about good versus evil. This is about people who want to destroy us, our civilization, and our way of life. Twenty years ago, on Iraq, U.S. mainstream news outlets sold their audiences on a narrative the WMDs, only to discover there were none, and that the geopolitics were far more complicated than they made them out to be. Still suffering from their own case of post-Iraq PTSD, American reporters and commentators seem more comfortable with the Ukraine story. I can't imagine attacking a country in which virtually everyone hates us uh, as opposed to applauding us, and we should remember in Iraq, they did applaud us. Its apparent simplicity allows for the return of the good old good versus evil narrative. When it's good versus evil, 
you gotta sometimes, when you're on the good side, have some ambiguity about discerning the real evil from the somewhat evil, I guess. A lot of that for me stems from this anxiety of uh, the war in Iraq, frankly. US the US media, for the last 20 years, they've been dealing with a war that doesn't adequately respond to these types of good versus evil binaries. They've been dealing with the mass destabilization of the Middle East, which followed from the invasion of Iraq in 2003. I think for many in the mainstream media, particularly the cable news media, the invasion of Ukraine is an opportunity to reframe that. If we can get enough in there, they'll push the Russians out. It will be a tremendous win for the West, and it'll be a real failure for Putin. They're still mostly old guard Cold War figures who want to see the old Cold War reestablish itself because that's the world that they understand. We have this bad actor, Vladimir Putin, who's on the side of evil, whereas the US and NATO are on the side of good. The American cable news is terrible at injecting any amount of context into anything. Good evening and welcome. Taking advantage of that gap in context is Tucker Carlson of Fox News. Better known for providing hyperbole than nuance and still prone to conspiracy theories on biolabs in Ukraine, Carlson does offer a rare critical take on the White House's position on this conflict. The reason why his show is so highly rated is because the man is extremely good at what he does. Why in the world would the United States intentionally seek war with Russia? What he's done is not pro-Putin, because that's impossible, right? You can't defend bombing hospitals, right? Killing babies and, right, killing pregnant mothers. You can't defend that. But you can be, or at least Tucker has been able to be, anti-anti-Putin. No one who knows anything and is honest will tell you Putin invaded Ukraine simply because he is evil. So the idea is that you're not pro-Putin, you're just against being against Putin. And I think it's a fascinating way to twist a narrative. The sanctions imposed on Russia by the West are having a punishing effect on its economy and people, at home and abroad. New York's Metropolitan Opera House says that any Russian artist who supports Putin or is supported by him is no longer welcome to perform there. FIFA and UEFA have banned Russian clubs and the national team from their football tournaments. The Russian team is also being scrubbed from FIFA's video game. Just tune into American news programs, late night entertainment shows, and you will find an antipathy for all things Russian. I hear you can get a job in Russia right away, mining arsenic and potash. And whatever potash they don't use for fertilizer, you can get to eat. There's more mass xenophobia, people um, vandalizing Russian businesses or demeaning Russians and to whatever extent that's encouraged by uh, mainstream media outlets. It's reprehensible and misguided, not only because it's bigoted and, and thoughtless, but because Russian people are not to blame for this war. This is Putin's war and Russian people are in many cases protesting against this war, which in Russia is a very dangerous thing to do. So anyone who's angry, rightly so, about Russia's invasion of Ukraine uh, is being very, very misguided if they're taking that out on regular Russian people. Abby Martin knows both sides of the story. She's an American journalist whose past work has become a casualty of this information war. From 2012 to 2015, Martin worked for the Kremlin-funded network RT, fronting a program called Breaking the Set. Earlier this month, YouTube did a mass takedown of material from Russian news sources, and Martin saw years of her work, journalism on a range of topics, just disappear. I have a lot of disagreements with RT and the direction they took after I left the network, but I'm a free speech absolutist, and I feel like having the Russian perspective is a crucial thing in this country when we are constantly fear-mongering and war-mongering against Russia. So Breaking the Set was banned. Uh, my entire catalog of critical interviews about U.S. imperialism, about Israel, about Saudi Arabia, all of those were just obliterated in the blink of an eye. This is the equivalent to modern book burning, and many are actually celebrating it without realizing what a slippery slope that is. The answer when you're responding to a country that is uh, arresting journalists and dissidents is never to 
take down speech that is critical of the official line. And what we're seeing on YouTube, maybe even more than on Facebook and Twitter, is a real willingness to take down anything that is critical of NATO's role in this conflict. You're responding to a propaganda war by creating your own version of propaganda. The way to respond to speech that contains misinformation or disinformation is, is, not, is never to just remove it. So after speaking to a few customers and friends... Ostracizing Russians, treating them with suspicion, should not be mistaken for a just response. There are ways to be critical of what Vladimir Putin is doing to the Ukrainian people without leaning into militarism. American journalism needs to make those distinctions and put them to use. Nuance is always called for, uh, even, even in the case of an aggressive war. And it should be possible to recognize this war for what it is. It should be possible to stand in basic solidarity with Ukraine without buying into jingoistic or propagandistic narratives. There is room for acknowledging complexity and history and also basic judgments of right and wrong. And I think the media should be capable of both at the same time. From the U.S. to Russia now, where despite the Kremlin's determination to control the narrative on Ukraine, some cracks have started to appear. Johanna Hus is here with more. As we've been reporting, criticism of Vladimir Putin's invasion is hard to come by in the Russian media, especially on the country's tightly controlled airwaves. State-backed channels parrot Putin's talking points and still refuse to call the quote, special operation, a war. But this past week, we've seen a stream of resignations at some of the country's top broadcasters. Lilia Gildjeva, a longtime anchor on NTV, and her colleague Vadim Glusker, who had been at the channel for almost 30 years, both quit. Maria Baronova, RT's former chief editor in Moscow, has cut ties with the network over its, quote, willingness to spread propaganda. And then there's what's been happening at Rossiya One. Jana Agalakova, the channel's Europe correspondent, resigned, reportedly over its Ukraine coverage. And that was on the back of the very public protest that made news by an editor at that same broadcaster, Marina Ovzhanikova. She crashed a live newscast with a placard condemning the lies her channel was spreading about Ukraine. Ozhanikova ended up getting fined about 300 US dollars, but her case remains under investigation. I made this decision by myself because I uh, uh, don't like um, uh, Russia starts this uh, invasion. The journalists making a stand have been praised, including by Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky, since condemning the invasion, calling it a war, is now a criminal offence in Russia, one that can lead to 15 years in jail. But these protests have been late in coming. And with the last of Russia's independent broadcasters, TV Dodged and Echo Moscow Radio shut down by the authorities, critical voices are in a minority that, by the Kremlin's design, keeps shrinking. Thanks, Joe. On to another conflict now, where Russia has also played a central role, Syria. It was 11 years ago this week, during the Arab Spring, that citizens there first took to the streets peaceful protests against the rule of President Bashar al-Assad. They were met with violence and brutality. Today, against long odds and with a little help from some powerful friends, Assad remains in power and other governments are slowly, quietly re-establishing relations. In fact, anyone browsing travel content on social media would be forgiven for thinking that normalization was already a done deal. Foreign travel bloggers have been visiting Damascus for years. Recently, they've even ventured into territory that had been under opposition control and was bombed accordingly by Syrian and Russian forces. The Listening Post's Ahmed Mahdi now on the curious world of travel vlogging and what looks like a victory lap for the Assad regime. Friday was the bloodiest day in a month of protests in Syria for crimes against humanity. For more than 10 years now, the headlines coming out of Syria have depicted dictatorship. This is the war Bashar Assad is waging on his own people. Death. Nearly 12,000 children have been killed or injured. And destruction. Entire neighborhoods lie destroyed. Leaving an apocalyptic scene. But in one corner of the internet, you can see a very different side to Syria. I love Syria, and you will not believe how amazing it is. I tried so hard. 
Good evening, guys. Right now I'm in Damascus. Thanks to some unlikely visitors. I first heard about travel bloggers to Syria post-war uh, in 2019. Good morning, guys, and welcome to Damascus, Syria. I didn't know what to expect from Damascus, really, but this, this wasn't really it. Like, it, just, it feels like any other nice touristy city. It was amazing to see Damascus again. That's where my mom lived for quite some time. And as a Syrian, I got very emotional seeing that footage and seeing Bakdash. It looks absolutely amazing. Seeing her eating the ice cream and they give it to her for free. But mostly I remember being kind of shocked that they were doing that already. This is a Syrian stamp. The travel vloggers were already heading to Syria as a travel destination. We are in Japan, guys. Another beautiful sunny day here in Barbados. Travel vlogging is a huge online industry. And to stand out, many vloggers have been visiting so-called alternative travel destinations. The kind more often seen in the headlines than the travel brochures. We're in Tripoli, <laughs> Libya. Unbelievable. It's a winning formula and it's generated millions of views and dollars for both the content creators and the social media companies. I was just so hyped on all the positive things about Syria. The people, the food, the love. But in a place like Syria, is this content cutting corners with the truth just to please the algorithms? You know, when there's a war, it's not raining bombs on every single inch of Syria. People are still living there. My family is still there. They still, you know, go to work every day. But this very simplistic view of life in Syria lacks nuance of how life actually is inside a war. These streets that I saw in the videos are, are real, but they're very touristy. Syria is very big and it's not one, one neighborhood or or one very Instagrammable street. So we just stopped for a photo of that. Look at that. I think that they pretty accurately reflect the life of wealthy Syrians in Damascus. And that's kind of the, the power of inviting travel bloggers into that city specifically, because it was less hard hit, because there are a lot of pro-regime Syrians, and especially wealthy ones, which are very much in the minority. Many of them are located in Damascus. So in terms of inviting tourism into Syria, Damascus is a very safe bet. We asked the Syrian Tourism Ministry whether foreign travel influencers were being invited into the country for PR purposes. They didn't respond. What we do know is that every tourist visiting Syria, travel vloggers included, is legally required to be accompanied at all times by a government-approved guide, what journalists would call a handler. So, while vloggers are exploring the markets of Damascus, oh my God. So good. roaming the ruins of Aleppo, or chatting to locals in Tartus. You Ahmed? Muhammad. 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 The eyes and ears of the government are never far away. Dawood Akhunzada knows this firsthand. He's a travel vlogger who just returned from Syria a few weeks ago. Of course, I had to get a guide. You cannot just wander around yourself as a tourist with a touristic visa in Syria. I'm here with my guide, Mary. Hi. Hi. So what the guides do after you leave the country, they're reporting it to the government. Where have you been and what you have done in the country? This is the real nightlife of Syria as of now. Check this out. I was there during the Christmas time. People were having fun in the cafes, having shisha. So this is one of the videos I shared as well. But I also shared other part of it, the leftovers from the civil war. Do you want to see what civil war brings to the country? Right now I'm in Syria in the biggest city called Homs and all around me is just destroyed buildings. I think people, specifically Syrians, had very mixed feelings about my content. They were thinking that I am sold out and I am, it's a propaganda for the government and I'm actually paid to be in Syria and make this content, which is absolutely not true. Syria is not only about civil war and depressing headlines, Hey Davood, fun fact, on Christmas Day, the same day you posted that regime-sponsored propaganda, six opposition fighters were murdered in northern Syria. One of the reasons why I made that TikTok about Davood is he specifically made a video of some destroyed buildings and his messaging was, see what war gets you, it gets you nothing. As a result, this is what we have left. Which to me was very heart-wrenching. There are results of the war with the regime. Every travel vlogger I'm aware of says, well, I'm not political. 
And, but how can you show the destruction of a political war and still be apolitical? When you go into a war zone and say it's apolitical, it's only documentation, and you're showing only one side, then if you're documenting, you should actually do more research and more work and go to places where you, know, you don't have a fixer from the side of the regime showing you around. This is a very political a space you're standing in that is under regime control, and the regime is showing you what they want the world to know. Part of the problem is that journalists are not being allowed in, except for media from countries the regime considers friendly, like Russia and Iran, states that have backed President Bashar al-Assad. Few foreign reporters have been able to visit government-held Syria in recent years. That's left the vloggers and other more controversial figures to fill the information gap. Blurring the lines between content creator and journalist. There was an army created inside Syria, which they called themselves Free Army, and they were fighting against Syrian government. I'm not a journalist, I'm just a simple content creator. And I feel like people uh, right now trust individuals and the content creators more than the news. What I wanted to do is just uh, show a little bit different side and more authentic side of Syria. Syria will become and as a very important destination for the region and for the touristic destination as well. And I do feel like the content I share helps it a little bit. Despite the ongoing fighting, the millions of Syrians displaced, and the fact that around a third of the country remains beyond his control, Assad is ready to reintroduce himself to the world. States that had once denounced his rule are now resuming diplomatic ties and along with it, lucrative energy and trade deals. For the global news audience, however, it's a much harder sell and that's why the regime needs all the help it can get. When you have 10 years of, of conflict, afterwards comes you know, the writing history part, the normalization with the world part. These vloggers are a very small part of this plan. I personally don't think that Tourism right now in Syria is ethical. It is only aiding the bigger message that the regime wants to come across, which is that Syria is safe. Syria is not safe, especially not for Syrians who want to return. Every Syrian wants the world to hear and to see Syria as they know it, as this beautiful, historical, magical place. And in that sense, who can blame the travel vloggers for wanting to tell that story? But this tourism without journalism is mostly harmful. I want the story of Syria to be told, <sighs> but I want the whole story told. And finally, if you find Tucker Carlson of Fox News tough to take in English, get a load of what he sounds like in Russian. The Kremlin has cleansed Western news narratives on Ukraine from the airwaves it controls, but it's clearly good with Carlson and his What Has Putin Ever Done to Us Act on Fox. According to the American news magazine Mother Jones, the Russian government has instructed news channels to broadcast as many Carlson clips as possible. A number of outlets are running with that dictate. Just take a listen to one of the voices translating Carlson's words and decide, is that a slightly excitable voice of translator or is it an act of mockery? We'll see you next time here at the Listening Post. Есть ли у Украины биологическое оружие? У Украины есть объекты для биологических исследований. Что? Демократы в Вашингтоне сказали вам, что ваш патриотический долг ненавидеть Владимира Путина. Многие американцы подчинились этой директиве. Ненависть к Путину стала центральной целью внешней политики Америки. Очень скоро эта ненависть может привести США к конфликту в Восточной Европе. Пшеница сейчас стоит на 60% дороже, чем в прошлом году. Таких цен еще не было в истории. Плохая новость для тех, кто собирается есть. Какие же мерзкие эти люди. И, конечно же, они продвигают войну, а не поддержку демократии. Украина не демократия, никогда ей не была. Это сателлит администрации Байдена. Они нам месяц уже рассказывают о том, что атака со стороны Украины невозможна. А если увидите, что украинцы используют наше оружие, то это вовсе не так, говорит нам Энтони Блинкин. 
это не они, это провокация русских. 